the the dominantly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant American society viewed certain uh, behaviors and substances substances to be off limits and others to be okay. And but there's, there's, there's it's completely arbitrary. It's not there's no science behind it. Welcome to Freedom, a show about ideas that matter. I'm Trevor Burris, and I'm Aaron Ross Powell. Today's episode features Dr. Jeffrey A. Singer, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute who works in the Department of Health Policy Studies. He is president emeritus and founder of Valley Surgical Clinics Limited, the largest and oldest group private surgical practice in Arizona, and has been in private practice as a general surgeon for more than 35 years. Today we discuss public health and the drug war. In some way, the drug war is a massive public health program, but that only raises the question of what public health is and what it should be. But before we get to this week's episode, we'd like to remind you that Freedom is a listener-supported show. If you like the show, please consider becoming a supporter. Learn more at www.freedom.audio. Now on to the episode. What is public health? We've heard, of course, a lot about public health in the COVID era. We continually hear about it when it comes to smoking and now vaping. I would say we even hear about it when it comes to the drug war. And people like to talk about public health a lot, but I've never heard a really good definition of it. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people have taken the time to define it. And over the last several decades, I think the definition has kind of spread out to be much more than was originally intended. So when I when I think of public health, I think of sort of uh, health issues of the commons. So, for example, uh, sanitation issues where where uh, you know one person can affect the health uh, safety uh, of others by not controlling their sanitation well and spread disease, or uh, areas where there are communicable and infectious diseases. Uh, and that people, whether they want to or not, could be spreading to others. So I've always considered public health to be uh, that area. So public health uh, officials, and I think that in a, in a uh, limited government, uh, you know, minimal state, there's a role still for, for public health experts to basically inform us about steps we could take to prevent in, you know, infecting one another or making one another vulnerable to catching diseases. And um, there's even a role to play, especially when you're dealing with areas of the commons, to kind of, you know, uh, umpire those kind of things to make sure that people aren't unintentionally, in, you know, jeopardizing the health of others. That's the way I see public health. But over the, the, the last several decades, because, you know, originally the CDC was called, uh, I think it was called the, the Center communicable disease center. And then it, it, it morphed into the center for disease control and then the center for disease control and prevention. So now uh, it seems to be just kind of a big busybody uh, concerning itself with what is, what it considers or what these, this, you know, what would experts in the public health community consider to be healthy activities and unhealthy activities and trying to um, influence what what uh, people's behavior based on what they think is in their best interests of health. Of course, health is very important. We all need it. But as individuals, we all have our own sets of priorities. So it's perfectly rational for an individual to say, I understand smoking tobacco is unhealthy and might make me die prematurely, but it gives me so much pleasure that I'm willing to accept that risk. But so to me, that's not a public health issue. That's a private health issue. Public health issues are, are, are dealing with things where people are unintentionally placing other people's health at risks, at risk. And some, somebody kind of needs to set a certain set of rules to say, these are things that you can't do in, in a public arena, a public sphere, because you're liable to jeopardize the health of others. But what you do in your private or in the private arena where you're not jeopardizing the health of others, that's not a public health issue. It's a private health issue, in my opinion. When Trevor and I were kids, and I guess I don't know if they still do this, there was the presidential physical fitness tests that we would have to do periodically. 
And those were part of the the federal government. Aaron, you're giving me PTSD having... on rope climbing right now. So because that was the one where yes. I was just constantly like, oh, my God, don't make me climb a rope. But anyway, continue. But the idea was that having physically fit kids is good for the nation, the the populace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and there often is this argument that the perhaps the, the version of public health that you have just outlined, Jeff, is is too narrow, that rather there's there's this sense in which if the general populace is, say, of low health, so uh, the obesity epidemic or other kinds of chronic illnesses and so on, those per, those create costs for the rest of us in terms of, I mean, so Medicare and Medicaid usage would be an obvious one, but there's lots of other kinds of costs. They can have costs um, that are non-monetary, people dying earlier or have costs on their, you know, on the economy plus their families, et cetera. So are, you are, you're rejecting that more expansive, but I guess, how do you, how would you respond to the argument that, look, the communicable diseases are a cost, right? Like they, that does harm to people. And so public health should be concerned about the spread of communicable diseases, but why shouldn't we care about these other kinds of costs that poor health creates? Well, I, I think that's a slippery slope. Uh, you know, I think. Tom Saz wrote about this years ago, uh, but if we start, uh, if we if we basically say that everybody's personal decisions, and it's true, it, you know, we none of us live in an atomistic world, so everybody's personal decisions can, maybe several steps removed, affect other people. But if we're going to start to get into the business of, for example, if you're in poor health, then it means that that uh, my taxes go up to cover your health expenses. Then it becomes a real slippery slope, and next thing you know, we have what Saz referred to as a therapeutic state, where we basically have a dictatorship of public health officials who are governing every aspect of your life because they could make the case that it's costing society if you don't follow what they think is the best uh, prescription for healthy living. And again, first of all, health, like I said, health is important, but it's not everything. Happiness is even, you could be happy even if your health is not good. Um, and, uh, but I just think that you, you, I just don't think that's, that argument is compatible with living, um, a full life as a human being, which requires you to be a free person. And it's, and, you know, I, just the other day, I heard Alex Narasta make this argument at the Soho Forum about how you hear when it comes to immigration, people say, well, you can't have immigration, open immigration in a welfare state because, um, you know, they, People exercising their inherent right to freedom of movement and freedom of association is going to cost the taxpayers money because they may access our welfare state. And Alex cleverly said, how come we only bring that up when it comes to, um, you know, immigration? For, you, you could also make the argument that the, the state should control how many children you may have because the number of children you have impacts the number of children we have to educate and pay for through the public education system. So maybe the government should dictate how many children left up. You can go on and on like that. So I just think we have to say that just because um, there are some, ex there are, if, if we choose as a society to kind of socialize certain costs, which I would consider to be an infringement of our rights, that's not an excuse for infringing other rights. What are we need to protect our rights, and if we've infringed some, we shouldn't create sort of like a you know exponential increase in right infringement by infringing new ones to protect the first set of rights that we infringed. Does it make much sense when you step back and look at the kind of behaviors that are uh, accepted or maybe accepted to some extent? So I mean, like smoking, drinking, but not taking heroin. Uh, now, maybe eating a McDonald's cheeseburger every day and whether or not that one is considered a good or a bad thing. I think another one that has been moralized in my lifetime is drinking soda. And I live here in Arlington, Virginia, amongst like fairly wealthy, uh, generally white people. And no one really drinks soda here and no one smokes. Um, but they have other behaviors that could be unhealthy. Like, can does it does it make sense when you say, OK, here's what's allowed. Alcohol is legal. Heroin is not. Smoking is increasingly prohibited. 
uh, vaping is becoming increasingly prohibited. Is, is there like a rhyme or reason to this? No, I think a lot of it is based upon uh, biases uh, generally held by the, the larger, the larger cultures, dominant culture. So we have, you know, as you and I wrote together about uh, Trevor in, in uh, a white paper, Cops Practicing Medicine, that, you know, the, the dominantly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant American society viewed certain uh, behaviors and substances, substances to be off limits and others to be okay. And, but there's, 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 it's completely arbitrary. It's not, there's no science behind it. I, I have to, you know, stipulate here that, that as a doctor, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you now as, as a, just as a human, a free human being. But as a doctor, when people are coming to me and asking for my advice, it, I will tell them, for example, I don't think it's a good idea for you to smoke. I don't think it's a good idea for you to drink too much, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just giving them my advice. I don't for a minute believe I have a right to impose that on them. But so just because I'm saying that every individual has their own set of priorities and, and uh, has a right to make their own choices doesn't necessarily mean that I'm, I'm thinking their choices are good ones. But, but that's really not up for me to decide. Um, getting back to your, your larger point, um, a lot of the currently prohibitive substances, if they what makes them so dangerous is the fact that they're prohibited. Because, uh, for example, alcohol, which is legal, causes much more harm to the physical body than opioids, for example. Of course, when you buy an opioid in the black market and you don't know its dose or if it's even is an opioid or what else may be in it, then it's dangerous. But, but, but generally speaking, opioids don't cause cirrhosis. They don't cause encephal encephalopathy like alcohol can do. They don't cause cancers of the GI tract like alcohol can do or pancreatitis or cardiomyopathy. Basically, they make you constipated. And uh, they, there is some research to suggest that they may suppress some of your gonadal hormones, which could lead to some osteo, osteoporosis. But that's a correctable uh, problem. Uh, but compared to some of the legal drugs, some of the illegal drugs, when used in a legal environment, are actually much safer. And the only reason we're seeing so many people die from them is because we're forcing them to go to the black market. What's interesting is we've talked to before a huge amount of, not a huge amount, but a lot of people who are consistent opioid users in history have been doctors because they can have access to them. And they know exactly how much to take. And they could do that for 50 years in a way that alcoholics can't. I mean, it, you know, they, in the, the degradation of the body from alcohol versus opioids, and doctors know that. Yeah, in fact, I'm a surgeon. And so one of the icons of my specialty, I consider the father of modern American surgery, was, was William Halstead who was a professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins in the late 19th century, early 20th century. In fact, s s most of the surgical, surgical technique we still use today was developed by him. Uh, some of the, the operations that he developed, we still do even to this day. And he's the one who created the residency program, um, which you know we have to this day. Well, we learned later in his life that First, he was a cocaine addict. And I have a little anecdote about a funny joke about that. So first, he was a cocaine addict. And his colleagues knew about this, and they were worried about him. So they, they, we, they took him famously on an, an ocean voyage to keep things discreet and had an intervention. And in, in those days, in the early 20th century, which now we laugh about it, but the belief was that the way to cure cocaine addiction was to treat it with morphine was a, so we basically it's replacing a, a stimulant addiction with a, a depressant addiction <laughs> so or sedative addiction so they actually did that and they got him onto morphine and everybody kept it quiet because this guy was such a you know valuable person and it, right until his retirement in fact during his most productive years he would come home each day and plug himself into morphine uh, and it take just enough before you leave for work to uh, 
just to kind of prevent withdrawal, sort of like methadone would be or buprenorphine. Put in a productive day and then come home. And then, of course, instead of having a, you know, a gin and tonic and kicking back and relaxing, listening to some music, he plugged himself into morphine. And that was kept secret until after he died. Uh, very accomplished uh, individual. There are plenty of people who can't talk about it that are doing that now. A little joke, though, when I started my surgical residency, that's when I learned about it. And things have changed now. There's been a lot of reforms to the residency program. But back in my day, I'm sounding like this old guy, um, we had to show up for rounds at 5.30 in the morning at, at the surgical intensive care unit. And we had, and we go from the ICU to the regular ward. And we had to get done no later than seven with rounds. And we interns were taking notes because the chief resident would be, you know, shouting out, we have to take so-and-so's drain out. We got to get the labs on this one. And we're taking all these notes down. And then we go down to the cafeteria and you had to eat real fast because surgery starts at 730. And if you don't get down there by seven, you're not going to have a chance for breakfast. And then it would go like that. We work until about 6 p.m., 7 p.m., have checkout rounds, go home, and come back the next day at 5.30, except if you're on call, then you stay until the next day around 6.30, 7 o'clock. And that went on and on. And then while, while, while I was in my first week or so, somebody mentioned that Halstead had been a cocaine addict. I thought, that explains it. Because I was thinking, when I mean, do that we, explains when do we this, this insane sleep? process that like, he invented. Yeah, 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 yeah. when... Exactly. When do we get to sleep at all here? I mean, you know, it's just go, 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 go. It's, it's changed now, although I'm a product of my generation. So uh, I, it's kind of become part of my, my habit now that I'm, you know, go, 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 go. So if the argument is we can't, we can't intervene coercively unless you're impacting your, your health decisions are kind of directly impacting others. So you're wandering around with a wildly communicable disease or some such. Uh, or driving does, a vehicle under the influence where you can sure, yes. jeopardize the safety of others, for example. Yes. Yeah. But what about, I guess, public health coercion for your own good? Because we acknowledge, like, if I am a raging alcoholic or I am wildly addicted to some substance, one of the things I can do is go to rehab. And rehab is essentially voluntary coercion, right? I'm, I'm locked away. People are physically preventing me from getting access to the drugs. My life is very structured. It's like I basically have taken control away from myself because the, the addiction meant that I didn't have the personal control to get out of the addiction, even if I wanted to. And and it does seem like for a lot of the kinds of things that we consider that get considered to be public health issues, so drug addiction, but also um, obesity and so on, we tend to categorize those as the kinds of choices that once made, you don't really, it's harder to like unmake those. You know, like I can, I'm anyone who could see the my whole back wall is books. I have a problem buying books, right? And I have a, a wife whose patience has run out with the quantity of bookshelves and whatnot. But I could, if I really wanted to, I could stop buying books, right? But it seems like a being addicted to a substance is somehow different from that, that even if I really wanted to, I might not be able to stop. And does that mean that there's kind of this opening for coercion? Well, I, I, I don't think it should be. And by the way, when you talk about rehab, that's one form of rehab. The, to me, the key, though, is, is it has to be voluntary. I don't think this, the state has a right to tell you that you need to give up your habit. It's important to, because, uh, to understand addiction, uh, this, regardless of uh, the ph a different healthcare practitioners' philosophy of addiction, we all agree that the, the working definition is compulsive use despite negative consequences. And by the way, that it's a compulsive behavioral disorder where, and I, I don't want to get too off topic here, but, but basically um, this b behavior, it, it could be gambling, it could be shopping, it could, there are a lot of, it could be sex addiction, but this behavior is sort of triggered uh, and some, at, at a, it reaches a point where it's, you're not even consciously aware of what may be triggering it or why you want to go there, but that becomes like your safe space. That's a coping mechanism that you've developed over the years. So depending on the substance, first of all, being addicted may not really 
be a bad thing. I mean, it may be inconvenient for you, but for example, uh, some people, I think I may be one of them, are addicted to caffeine. And I, I mean, I just drink coffee all day long uh, and uh, I, I don't feel right unless I have it. Uh, but I don't think that's causing me negative consequences. In fact, a lot of the negative consequences result from the prohibition. So there are a lot of people out there, like we've been talking about, who could even be have it, it could either be a chemical dependence, which is different than addiction, or it could be an addictive, an addiction to a substance or behavior. And as long as they're not harming others directly, um, then they got to decide if it's becoming enough of a problem for them that they want to do something about it. And then I want to also say there are lots of different theories of the best way to treat addiction, which also might vary depending on what you're addicted to, whether it's a substance or a behavior. But um, most of the research suggests that abstinence-only approaches are the least successful. They've done it. They had great marketing. And uh, in these drug courts that exist today, most of the time, because of their marketing, judges will you know, sentence you to an abstinence-only program, like a 12-steps program. But the fact is that, um, for example, Stanton Peel did a lot of work on this in the 1990s. Uh, he developed, when it came to alcohol addiction, what he called moderation management. And when you're asking somebody who, you know, they have this deep-seated, compulsive need to, to engage in this behavior because it, 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 it's, they're driven by, it's triggered by certain things. It, it, it's actually filling this need. It's their safe place. To ask them to completely stop doing this, that's a big ask. It might be easier to say, how about if we do it less often and, 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 and so that we're not doing as much harm to ourselves by doing that. And then once we get to a point where we're able to do it less often, we could talk about maybe even doing it even less often or not. You know, I mean, if you can get your, let's use the alcohol as a you know, legal example. So, and I know some people that this personally that, that would fit this description where they were really drinking a lot and it was an obvious problem and they were starting to have personal, interpersonal relationship problems, work problems, et cetera. Um, and they got help, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't stay with an abstinence only program. And, but they've managed, they worked on it. And I know a couple of these people where they will go out to dinner and they'll have a glass of wine or two. Uh, and there'll be maybe one or two times during the day at a social setting at, you know, like a happy hour. Well, I'll have a drink, but it doesn't seem to be out of control anymore. So they were able to kind of come up with a compromise. And I think it's important for the general public to have a better understanding of, of, of addiction. I mean, there tends to be this almost cartoon-like understanding of what addiction is. And it's, it's very complicated. And there's a spectrum and there's a lot of gradations. But the, the working principle is compulsive use despite negative consequences, which is why, for example, thinking that you could arrest, you know, you could incarcerate your way out of the drug abuse problem is a fool's errand because that, going to jail is a negative consequence. The whole thing is all about compulsive use despite negative consequences. That's, that's not going to work. In fact, the evidence is it makes it worse. Look, prison is a negative consequence and you still do it. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting, yeah. though, with addiction where sometimes people, well, actually not sometimes, quite often the public health establishment will talk about addiction as a way of nullifying choice and say, you, you know, you're not choosing this voluntarily anymore. You're now addicted. And it seems like they're always trying to say people are addicted to fast food and they're addicted to sex and they're addicted to smartphones. That's probably the most recent one. They're addicted to video games. Like if you postulate that, then you can destroy the idea that someone is choosing this in a way that makes them happier and, yeah. and create a lot of control. Like if you do that, it seems like there's an addiction creep. Yeah. And of course, if everything that, that you like to do becomes an addiction, then there's addiction has no meaning anymore. It just becomes, I like to do this. So no, I, if we're going to talk about it, you know, clinically, there is a, and, and another thing that, uh, you know, the media and public policy uh, people have a pr problem with, and I, I must admit, even we doctors make this mistake, is the in, using the words addiction and dependency interchangeably, but they're two completely different things. So 
the dependency is seen with lots of different categories of drugs where your 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 body physiologically adapts to its presence, and if you abruptly withdraw it, you could have a horrible withdrawal reaction. In some cases, fatal Xanax. ones. Before, yeah, you can go in. Well, the benzodiazepines were originally developed to, to treat epilepsy. So if you suddenly withdraw them, and by the way, you can still Valium is still an excellent drug to treat status epilepticus, which is when a seizure doesn't stop, uh, given intravenously and it stops it. So if you've been on a benzodiazepine for a long time and suddenly withdraw it, you can go into status epilepticus. And so usually the withdrawal is whatever the drug was designed to prevent. That's what happens when you withdraw it. So beta blockers, which are very commonly used for high blood pressure, for example, um, if you abruptly stop them, you have to be tapered. Um, you could have a hypertensive crisis and have a stroke or a heart attack. So you need to be gradually weaned off a beta blocker if you want to be put on a different blood pressure med. So nobody would, everybody would laugh if you suggested you're addicted to a beta blocker, but, but they don't, but, but when it comes to some, you know, of the taboo drugs, the dependency equals addiction, but, uh, there's a big difference. And in fact, um, and people who deal with addiction, with people with substance use disorder will tell you, sometimes it becomes difficult to sort out when a person's been on a, u- using a drug for a long time, how much of their, of, of their drug-related behavior is trying to, you know, is aversion to withdrawal or is addiction. And sometimes they don't even know, you know, because they're trying to avoid that, that hellish experience of going, going through an opioid withdrawal. So maybe they're not using compulsively because it's their safe space. Maybe they're using compulsively because they don't want to feel sick. Yeah, as a former and as a smoke, former, sm- a former smoker, I, I still use nicotine in, in much less qualities, quantities. But, man, you know, you try and quit and then you say, I'm feeling very anxious right now and I kind of want a cigarette to make me calm down. But is that just my addiction or is that my psychology? Hard, hard to even know the answer. It's to hard that. to know. Although it's the nicotine that, that that's interesting, that has the... Con- that's kind of a paradoxical effect of nicotine. It has both a calming effect and a stimulative effect. As long as, if you don't mind, as long as we're talking about nicotine, everybody's got this thing with problem with nicotine, like nicotine vapes. Actually, nicotine is not that dangerous a drug. It's sort of in the same category as caffeine, and nobody seems to be too uh, worried about people having caffeine. Now, you can have toxic levels of caffeine, just like you could have toxic levels of nicotine. Um, and there was a recent study, uh, I actually blogged about this, it's fascinating. It's been known for years that people with schizophrenia are very heavy smokers. They're like chain smokers, and, and nobody can figure out why. But now there's research suggesting that, you know, with schizophrenia, there's sort of a discombobulation of your thought patterns. That's really what schizo means, you know, shattering, disorganized. And uh, I, they, it, it seems that nicotine helps kind of reorder your thought processes and get rid of a lot of that confusion. So now some people are thinking, well, maybe uh, the reason why people with schizophrenia smoke so much is, you know, they've kind of just learned to self-medicate, that it's it's kind of helping them to be organized in their thoughts. And um, at, at some, some uh, mental health centers, they've done experiments by just giving these smoking schizophrenic patients offering them nicotine e-cigarettes instead. So at least they're getting the nicotine they need and they, they became avid users of them. They're getting the nicotine they need without the harmful effects of the tobacco leaf. And uh, so that's just interesting because again, we've, we've just, we have these almost these urban myths. We've just assigned all sorts of evils and dangers to drugs. And most, most drugs uh, are when used, properly, the reason why people use them is because they have certain effects that people like and benefit from, either psychically or physically. Just this week as we're recording, the the New York Times columnist Brett Stevens published a column about Oregon's experience with decriminalizing small amounts of, of hard drugs. And he calls it, I think in the the headline is the hard drug decriminalization disaster. So he's he thinks this has not worked out. And the crux of his argument is that 
cities are flooded with junkies who are homeless, suffering, also causing crime, public disturbances, etc. I last summer moved back to Denver from the D.C. area, and it is quite noticeable how high the Denver homeless population is compared to the, when I lived here 15 years ago. Um, and talking with people who work in city government, a lot of them, friends who work in city government in Denver, a lot of them say at least a big part of this is fentanyl usage, that that it's different than other kinds of drugs that have, you know, because drugs are fads, they come and go. Fentanyl seems to be particularly bad. Does this kind of experience cut against the the problem is is the criminalization? Because it seems like at least with fentanyl, it's either like these drugs have been partially legalized or they're just widely available. And the effect seems to be a whole lot of people who are, you know, it's not the kind of usage that you and Trevor were just describing of it's it's the alternative to my gin and tonic. I'm going to take it in the evening and just as kind of a recreational thing, but it doesn't really impact the rest of my life. These things seem to be having dramatic and really widespread impacts. And so wouldn't enabling more access just make those kinds of problems worse? Yeah, I, you know, there's been in, in the last month or so, they've been in several uh, venues, New York Times, Washington Post, articles suddenly from people, I don't know about Brett Stevens in the past, but from people who have advocated for decriminalization, suddenly saying, look what's happened to San Francisco, look what's happened to Port Portland. Uh, there was even an article in the Washington Post talking about drug use increasing on the streets in Portugal. But I, I think this is, first of all, this is unfair. Uh, decriminalizing drugs is not the same as legalizing drugs. So people are still having to go to the black market to get drugs which they can't be sure of, about their dosage or uh, safe, you know, whether or not they're contaminated, et cetera, et cetera. So that's number one. Number two, um, all of these judgments are being passed like right as we're coming out of the COVID pandemic. So uh, the article the, in, in Oregon's case, voters passed uh, 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 an initiative in November 2020 uh, that decriminalized all drugs and took effect in 2021. Well, you know, there was something going on in 2021, all of 2021 and into 2022, which was you know, the COVID pandemic, there were, and, and ports, I mean, Oregon was particularly, they had particularly uh, prolonged lockdowns in, in Oregon. Their policy was not nearly as, as flexible as Colorado, for example, or Florida or South Dakota. So, uh, and not only that, but part of the, the program of decriminalization was to set up a bunch of harm reduction programs so that policemen can go to people who they see using on the street and say, would you like some help? I can get you some help. But they weren't able to even implement those programs because everything was locked down. So then one year later in 2022, they got some data showing drug use has gone up in Oregon. Well, first of all, I got news for you. Drug use has gone up everywhere in the world. Alcohol consumption has gone up everywhere. In the world, and that's all because of the, exacerb the exacerbation of mental health problems and loneliness and isolation that occurred during the pandemic. So I think it's really unfair to take a snapshot, you know, one and a half years after this law went into effect, during a time when it was virtually impossible to implement it properly, and at a time when the whole world was stressed and make some, and make some sort of judgment. That's number one. Even in Portugal, and this, this is what I I wrote a letter to the editor of Washington Post about this, and they published it. Uh, they were the the article was talking about how in the last between 2019 and 2022, uh, while Portugal still is among the lowest in Europe in terms of adult and teen illicit drug use, it's gone up considerably. And again, I say, well, what happened between 2019 and 2022? You know, uh, how about telling us how it is relative to before 2001 when drugs were decriminalized in Portugal. They don't mention that at all. Some policemen who were interviewed say, uh, were quoted saying, it's gotten bad. It's almost as bad as it was before we decriminalized drugs. Of course, that's just this one 
or to policemen's observations. So there's a lot of unfairness here. Now, as far as as uh, uh, homelessness is concerned, yeah, substance use, particularly when you have to go to the black market to get it, is a major factor in a homeless situation. But it's multifactorial, as as I'm sure you know. I mean, different states seem to have a bigger homeless problem than other states. Has a lot to do with their uh, land use laws, zoning laws, nimbyism. You can't build high density housing in certain areas to get housing for people. And then finally, I had a conversation you may be familiar with uh, uh, Dan Shapiro, who's a professor of philosophy at West Virginia University. He just retired, but we were having a talk about this, and he said, "You know, this is uh, this is actually something that libertarians should talk more about. We don't seem to go there." But there's there's nothing wrong with having you know public nuisance rules in the community. It's it's compatible even if even if you were you know uh, an ANCAP, then you would believe that the you know the homeowners association and the insurance companies would set some rules. So there's nothing wrong with saying um, you know if if you want to use drugs, that's your right to use them, but use them over in this part of town. Because where you're using them right now is is disturbing a lot of people, or you know you can't do it on other people's property that's trespassing. Same thing with homeless. You know if you want to if you want to camp out, we're going to designate parts of the town where you're, you know, welcome to set up your tent. But over here, people are trying to go to work, and this is a bad place. There's nothing wrong with doing that, and I don't think and I think we don't we don't give that option enough attention. And in a lot of these cities where this is homelessness has become a problem, it seems like, like there's a reluctance to do something like that. It doesn't necessarily involve, I mean, I've, I've given a lot of thought about it since then, a lot of thought to this. You don't necessarily have to involve, you know, something like incarceration or, co- or even, you know, violence. Uh, I would suggest for, just like we have a separate branch of the police, like the meter maids sort of, you know, take care of, you know, parking tickets and they don't have weapons and they just, you know, go around uh, giving citations for parking in the wrong place. I could see, I can envision having like a, a division of the police force who are unarmed. Maybe they have pepper spray with them for self-defense purposes. And their job is to say to people, listen, um, take, could you take this somewhere else? I'll be happy to help you get there, but, but we don't allow this to take place in this part of town. And, you know, especially if they don't have weapons with them and, and they, they approach it in a, in a, you know, a civil, gentle way, non-hostile way. I think I don't see anything wrong with communities adopting those kind of practices, and I think that'll go a long way to solving the problem. But you know, you're going to continue. There's always going to be mental health problems. There's always going to be, uh, and, it, there, and there are a lot of different causes for for homelessness. So, should all drugs be legal? In, so, in at least in so. some sense, yeah. does that just mean like go to Walgreens, go to vending machines, go to yeah. And just get heroin um, or fentanyl, any of that? I I think so, yes. I think it's, you know, it's our body. We have the right to self-medicate. And even if we're not medicating, we're maybe just recreationally enjoying something, and I have a right to do that. It's interesting. Um, when I thought about that years ago, I thought, wouldn't that be an interesting paradox if we did that? So, you know, you can go into a store and buy heroin, or uh, cocaine, or, you know, a psychedelic, but you need a prescription for Tylenol with codeine. How does, how, how do we reconcile well, that? Well, that's pretty dangerous. I so mean, then, like, or, or yeah. antibiotics, which, which you can yeah. make the argument that antibiotics have a negative externality. Yeah, you can make that yeah. argument. Yeah. But, yeah. but I mean, does drug use go up if drugs are legalized? Possibly. Uh, I would say that, I mean, after we legalized alcohol, initially alcohol use went up, then it came down and, 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 and temporized. But also um, when it does go up initially, since it's legal, there's a great opportunity for people to share information with one another about how to, how to safely use it, how to avoid problems related to it. Uh, the, there's an, a vested interest in the legal dealers of these drugs to, uh, to, to, you know, recommend different dosages or safe, you know, that are safer for the customer. You know, we're already seeing that now with cannabis shops, right? Where people come in and say, look, uh, 
I'm sort of a novice. I haven't smoked pot since I was in college 30 years ago. What do you recommend for me to get started with as a, as a beginner's uh, dose? And they help you with that stuff. That's that's what business is all about. So I think that, yeah, I think there's there certainly is a risk that drug use will go up. But I, as we got, as we said in the beginning of this discussion, that's a private health issue, not a public health issue. And our experience with with drugs like alcohol suggests that there may be a, a like a, a bump up and then things will kind of level off and then people will tend to use more safer, safely and moderately and in more social settings. It's always struck me as interesting that we have a significant amount of brain altering drugs that are prescribed uh, since the Prozac revolution of the early 90s. And we have more, we mentioned Xanax, um, ADD drugs, and we make a distinction between these two. But but could you see pharmaceutical companies coming in and, and creating things from like opioids for the purpose, not for pain relief, but for the purpose of anxiety relief or other currently illegal substances where they could actually make things? Because that's what people are doing when they take Xanax. That's an anxiety relief drug. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's highly addictive, as we said. So could we have drug companies actually innovating with these currently illegal substances? Yeah, but right now we have this regulatory capture of like the Food and Drug Administration. So, for example, and I, I speak to some people in the psychedelics movement who tell me they're, they're kind of disturbed by this because, you know, it's okay that the FDA has approved ketamine, which is a, a kind of psychedelic because that's made by pharmaceutical companies. And there's another kind of variant of ketamine that's really recently approved. But if you wanted to use mushrooms, well, that's a naturally occurring substance, so they're not approving that. Um, and so, you know, if if a company can come along and make a synthetic version of this naturally occurring substance and charge you a lot of money for it, then it's okay. But if you could just, you know, grow it yourself and, 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 uh, and, and use it, you know, that way, that's not okay. Um, like I said a few, a few minutes ago, you got this interesting paradox where I need to get a prescription for, you know, let's say, you know, women need to get a prescription for birth control pills in this country, unlike in a hundred other places. But uh, so they have to get a prescription for birth control pills. But if we legalize drugs, they wouldn't have to get a prescription for heroin. And this is what kind of uh, prompted me. um, It must be about four or five years ago now. I had read uh, Jessica Flanagan's fantastic book called Pharmaceutical Freedom, where she gets into the right to self-medicate. And I kind of, after reading her book and thinking about what I just said, uh, it got me to to write this paper with Michael Cannon from Cato called Drug Reformation, because to me it questioned the whole why, why do we have to have a a government agency telling us that you know what we are allowed to put in our bodies, and uh, also deciding what I have to get a permission slip from another autonomous adult in order to put that drug in my body, like a doctor or a nurse practitioner or whatever. So. You know, I, if I want to use a certain drug, I can't use it unless this other adult like me gives me permission to use it. And, and you know, that's not to say we don't, there's, there's definitely a need for, uh, you know, organizations uh, to test drugs uh, for safety, for efficacy. But that was being done before the FDA got involved in it. In fact, the FDA wasn't doing anything about efficacy until the Keith Alver Harris amendments, and I think it was 1962. And uh, up until then, they would just approve it as safe and let let the medical community find what works and what doesn't work and put it and publish it in their literature, which is the way it was done. Uh, there's obviously there's a need for this information, so this this need will be met. But to have some sort of uh, monopoly by the government with the force of a gun saying this drug, I'm going to allow you to take this drug, but I'm not going to allow you to take that one. Or I'm going to allow you to take this drug, but only if you get another adult to say it's okay. I, I it, it, it really, it, 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 I find it very disturbing. It, it far, you know, it, it really, I find it morally reprehensible. Even though, of course, this is the system I operate under, and I'm one of the adults that has to give you permission to take a drug. So, you and I, Jeff, are 
largely on the same page on these issues. But for most of this conversation, I've been raising common critiques and they've been coming – most of them have been coming from kind of a conservative perspective. So let me let me switch gears now and bring a critique of what we were just talking about from a more progressive kind of lefty perspective. And that is we know that corporations want you to buy their product. They want you to buy a lot of their product. They want you to like they they want you to keep buying their product. And we see this play out in the way that say smartphone apps are often intentionally designed and highly tested in order to be addictive with like the pacing of rewards and the interfaces and so on like the companies are you know, they this isn't like a conspiracy theory. They set out to make their apps as addictive as possible because it boosts their bottom line. And so if we did everything you just suggested, which is basically open this up to manufacturers to make recreational drugs, we take away the prescription gate, we take away the the barrier of legality, shouldn't we be concerned that companies, rather than some drug cartel harvesting plants will be putting all of those resources that they currently put towards developing you know, developing drug prescription drugs into making the most highly addictive substances that they can and charging us money for it. And so it's not to say legalization would mean more access to the kinds of things that we have now just in more controlled doses. It's instead legalization would unleash all of the evils of capitalism to make us you know, dope heads constantly every day. So we're funneling money to the drug companies. Well, we haven't seen that with alcohol, but what I would say, and this probably wouldn't satisfy a person on the progressive left, but I would say that's, there, there are two things that uh, play a major role here. One, of course, is competition in the marketplace. Uh, the other is civil tort law. And I think that's that's a very important uh, you know intermediary that keeps if 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 you could show that that there was a malicious intent by a, a a company that makes a particular drug to try to actually get you to be addicted to it, then you know you got a you got a nice lawsuit that you 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 could show harm. I would that's probably not satisfactory to some people, but that's my answer. In addition to that, I would also add. That you're not going to have a perfect world where nobody has substance use disorder or nobody has other, you know, act, they engage in, in activities that are harming themselves. That's just the world and you can't make it into something that's a utopia. Thank you for joining us on Freedom. This is a listener supported show. If you'd like to get access to episode transcripts, bonus content, extended conversations, and our Discord community, go to www.freedom.audio.